Hey, if you're watching us online or you're tuning in on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, Nora and I always hang out after service, so if I haven't had a chance to meet you, we would love to meet uh, every one of you. Hey, will you do me a favor? If you haven't downloaded our New Hope East Lake app, will you download that? It is a one-stop shop. It has the message notes on there for Sunday morning. It has the Bible on there. It has all of our coming events, all the classes, and all of the events that we talked about that need registration. You can register um, for that on there. You can give on there as well. Um, it has links to our 2024 generosity uh, initiative. It also has the link to thisismybible.io, just all kinds of stuff on our app. So if you have not downloaded that, if you'll do that, that would be absolutely um, amazing. So we are beginning a year-long study here at New Hope called This Is My Bible. And every single week, with the exception of Easter Sunday, we are going to go through a different book of the Bible, beginning today with Genesis and ending in December with the book of Revelation. And it's going to be an amazing series. I'm going to teach through each book of the Bible, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different parts of each book. So we're going to look at his, the historical content of each book. We're going to look at key people, key events of each book. And then we're going to look, at, lastly, on the life applicational component of each book. So kind of three sections that we're going to look at each week when it comes um, um, to those to those books. I'm asking you to do three things. Three things. Number one, bring your Bible to church every Sunday. Lift them up. Come on. Lift them up. Who brought their Bible today? Yes, look at this, man. Amazing. Bring your Bible to church every single Sunday. A physical copy if you need one, if you don't have one, if you don't own a Bible. I talked to a couple of people in the 9 o'clock service said, I got a Bible for the first time ever. Isn't that amazing? And so we have Bibles at guest services. If you need one, we have them there. So we're asking you to bring your Bible to church. I know it's a habit. Get into the habit. Bring in your Bible every single week to church. The second thing that I'm asking you to do is to read the Bible every day. Every single day. Read the Bible every day. If you missed last week's message, go to our YouTube page. I talk about why it's so important to be in God's word consistently. It, it, it changes everything for us when we read God's word. Read the Bible every day, even if it's just one verse. Even if you can just read one verse, read the Bible every single day. It'll transform your life. It will. The third thing I'm asking you to do, and that's for those of you that really want to be challenged, that is to read through the entire Bible in one year. Did you know if you read the Bible 12 minutes a day, you can read through the entire Bible in a year? 12 minutes. That's it. 12 minutes a day. We have put together an incredible plan, a reading plan. If you'll go to thisismybible.io or you can click on the link in our app, there's a Bible reading plan that begins today. And uh, we put together a reading plan that goes, um, that corresponds with, with, uh, with this study that we're gonna be doing through the whole year. And so you can read through the Bible, you can print it off, you can screenshot it, whatever you wanna do. But we put together an awesome plan for you um, so that you can follow along and read through the Bible um, in an entire year. If you've never done that, I really wanna encourage you um, to do that. We're going to be releasing podcasts every week and beginning tomorrow, our staff is going to do daily devotions on that book of the Bible. So today we're going to begin uh, uh, the book of Genesis. So this week, Monday through Friday, our staff every day will do a short devotion, two to three minute de devotion on different parts of that specific book. So follow all of our social media accounts, our Instagram, Facebook, whatever else we have. I don't know. Follow them all because we'll release those um, on all of our social media outlets. And you can go to thisismybible.io. Um, so, are you ready? Let's get into this. We have 50 chapters to cover today. Well, you know I made it. 
because we're at second service and I'm still not preaching my first message, so we're, we're, we're good, right? Hey, another thing that we did, this is amazing. This is amazing. We put together an overview for you. You received one when you walked in. You, they're also on our app on, uh, under the message notes. So if you don't want a physical copy, I heard people saying they're gonna put a notebook together with this. And Johanna did an amazing job. These look beautiful. Basically, this is like a traditional kind of outline of the book, but we did it in a modern way. So we're gonna do an overview of every single book. So you can keep these like a cheat sheet of every book of the Bible on the back are my message notes for that specific week. So um, just a really good thing to kind of follow along. All right, so let's get into it. You ready? Turn to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. It's real easy to find. Go to the very front of your Bible and turn a couple pages and you'll be in Genesis, all right? Very easy. So all of you can be like, yeah, I'm a Bible scholar. I know where I, I can find a book of the Bible. All right, so we've developed kind of seven different mini-series within the overall series of This Is My Bible. And what we're going to be doing is the next five weeks, we're going to be focusing on the first five books of the Bible. And we're calling this five-week series Foundations. Foundations, because these first five books are the foundation for everything that we see in God's Word. Now, there's a couple of names, and this is in your overview and it's in your notes. There's a couple of names for the first five books of the Bible. Did you know that rabbis and, and, and Jews used to memorize the first five books of the Bible in its entirety? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They memor memorize all five of them. These are known, there's some terms for these books that maybe you've heard. There's a couple of terms. The first one is Torah. Torah. You've probably heard this called the Torah. These are the books of Moses or the Torah. The Torah just simply means law, right? So this is, this is the law. This is the book of instruction. Maybe another name that you've heard. Um, is a word called Pentateuch. Pentateuch. So that's another name that's often used when describing the first five books. That just simply means the five tools or the five instructions. It actually goes a little further. The five useful tools or books or scrolls. So they're the five useful books. The law, the books of the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch. So let's look at the historical content of the book of Genesis. What's interesting, um, these days, is because of technology, we have the ability to find out more about ourselves than we ever have. Our history, our roots, our family heritage, companies like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, you can find out all kinds of stuff about you and your family, what mixture you are, and all the different things that, that where our roots are. How many of you have ever done that before? Ancestry.com or 23andMe? No, not really? Not many of you have done that? Okay, so it's interesting. My cousin did this for our family. Um, and our family, like dads have a way of disappearing. And so, um, um, and so we, 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 we've had a hard time kind of tracking our family. And, and so, but my, my, my cousin did this and we we're able to find some stuff about our family um, through my dad's side. My grandma was actually born in New York, my dad's mom, and she, but she grew up in Canada. And her mom, her mom, mom, just two generations. She was born in England and lived in England. It, it's an amazing thing to be able to find. And we've also found family members that we had no idea were our family members, and they didn't know that we were their family members. It, it's kind of crazy um, that you can do this. And so you can find a lot of stuff about your roots and your beginnings and where you're from. And this is what the book of Genesis is all about. It's a book of roots. It's a book of foundations. It's a book of where we came from. It's a book of where our faith came from. It's a book of, 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 of where Israel came from and how everything started. And there's so much that goes on today even. In 2024 now, in two, thank you, in 2024, um, um, how things are still going on around the world today that trace themselves all the way back 
to Genesis. It's an amazing thing. Genesis was written by Moses. Most attribute the first five books, they call them the books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, to Moses. Genesis is the foundation of the entire Bible. If we don't understand Genesis, nothing that follows will make sense. Did you know that Genesis was not the original name of the book of Genesis? It's actually a Hebrew word called bedeshit. It's not a cuss word, bedeshit. Um, and it literally means in the beginning. So the book um, before, uh, um, before they changed it, it was actually called in the beginning, or bedeshit is the, is, the, um, is the Hebrew term. Now, when they translated the Old Testament into the New Testament, uh, um, in, into the New Testament, they change it to Genesis. So Genesis is a Greek word, which means origin. And it's really a good name. Um, it's, a, it's a really good name. There's a term that maybe you've heard, it's called the Septuagint, where the Old Testament was translated um, into the modern language um, of Greek during that time. And some of the names um, had changed, like the book of Genesis. So in Genesis, we see the origin of all things. We see the origin of heaven. We see the origin of earth. We see the origin of humans, the origin of sin, God's plan to deal with sin, the origin of marriage. We see the origin of family, human government, the origin of Israel. So, book, so the book of Genesis is truly a book of beginnings. We're calling it foundations. It's a book of foundations. It's the beginning of time and the beginning of human life and the beginning of fellowship with God, the beginning of sin and judgment. But it's also the beginning of grace, the beginning of work, the beginning of worship, the beginning of family, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of the generations. Genesis splits in the kind of two main sections. The first section is Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Again, this is in your overview. This is in your notes. Genesis 1 through 11 covers about 2,000 years. And you have four major events that happen in chapters 1 through 11. The first one is creation. That happens in chapters one and two. Then you have the fall with Adam and Eve in chapters three through five. Then you have the flood with Noah and his family, chapters six through nine. Then you have the beginning of generations in chapters 10 and 11. The second part of Genesis, chapters 12 through 50, covers around 300 years. And you have four significant major people. So in, in Genesis, it speaks of four major events. Creation, fall, flood, generations. And then you have four significant people. You have Abraham. You have Isaac. You have Jacob. And you have Joseph. And I added one more we'll talk about here in just a little bit, Noah. But basically the book of Genesis is this, four major events and four significant people. Does that make sense? Easy enough, right? So that's Genesis. So as you're reading through it, um, um, look at those things. So let's get into some key verses and some key moments in the book of Genesis. I have some friends that are going to help me read. We're going to read the entire chapter of chapter one in the book of Genesis. Where are my friends at? They're going to come out and read. There we go. We have Alex and Kat. And so turn to Genesis chapter one. Yeah, give them a pan clap. Thank you, guys. Yes, all right. So they're going to read Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at the entire chapter. So open your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, and let's go, Alex. Thank you. In the okay, in stop the right there. Stop, stop, <laughs> stop. We can't get too far without me preaching a little bit, right? Listen, these first four words are essential. In the beginning, God. If you can accept that, you can accept everything that follows. If we can accept that, then everything that follows doesn't make sense to us. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, 
God. If we can accept this miracle, then the miracle of creation, the miracle of raising the dead, the miracle of making the lame walk again, the miracle of causing the blind to see, that's all cake. If we can get past this right here, in the beginning, God, because for us, as human beings, everything in our minds has a beginning and it has an end. Everything. And you know we only use a small portion of our brain, and so we don't know everything. We think we do, but we don't. In the beginning, God. Everyone has a beginning except God. He has always been and he always will be. And I know we can't even wrap our minds around that. God was never born. God was never created. God has always existed. Psalms chapter 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. The eternal God. No beginning, no end. In the beginning, God. Go ahead, Alex. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness, God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky. And the evening passed, the morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so the dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and the trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening passed, and the morning came, marking the third day. Then God said, Let the lights appear in the sky to separate from the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with the fish, sorry, with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. All right, stop for just a minute. This is an important verse. Very important. Look what it says. Let us make man in our own image. This is our glimpse into what we call Trinity. God the Father God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, God's presence within us. This is this glimpse. Let us, who's us? 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We have this glimpse of, of Trinity. Remember, when we think of the Trinity, okay, people say, oh, you worship three gods. No, we don't worship three gods. No, think, don't think addition, think multiplication. It's not one plus one plus one equals three. It's one times one times one equals one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just like me as a person, I'm a dad, I'm a son, I'm a cousin, I'm a, pat, I'm a lot of things, but I'm me. God in three dispensations, God the Father, God the Son who came to this earth, Jesus Christ, and then God the Holy Spirit, God sent his spirit after Jesus died on the cross. Matter of fact, John, at the beginning of his letter, begins the gospel of John much like what we see here. In the beginning, he says in chapter one, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with him God created everything through him. This is speaking of Jesus. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. So here we see Trinity right in chapter one. Go ahead. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea and birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So Genesis chapter 1. So if you forgot to read the Bible, you just read chapter 1, all right? Another key verse is in chapter 3. The fall has happened. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've done the very thing that God told them not to do, which all of us have done. In verse 15, another very important verse where he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This passage is often referred to as the mother promise. And this sets the tone for the entire Old Testament and the words that were addressed to the serpent or an agent of Satan, this enmity that is placed between mankind and the serpent implies that God, who is also the serpent's enemy, is mankind's friend. He's our friend. And the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent, which tells us that there's a promise of a redeemer that one day Messiah is going to come and redeem us from our sins. God will save his people even though they've fallen. Even though they've done the very thing and they hid from God. The very thing God told them not to do. Sin entered into this world. This knowledge of good and evil. God already had a plan. And from this point forward in the Old Testament. Every single thing. All the revelation. Everything points to Messiah everything to Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Genesis sets the stage for the redemption of all mankind. So Genesis is the foundation of the freedom from the bondage of sin. So we've looked at the historical context. We looked at some key verses. Now let's look at some key people and some key events. If you turn to chapter 6, there's another person that I didn't put in the top four, but another person that I want to introduce you to. You probably already know him. You heard about him when you were a little kid if you went to church. And that is Noah. Noah, in chapter six, verse five, it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that the every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Isn't that horrible? And I know sometimes we feel like that today, like the intent of people's hearts every single day is on evil. 
And this is what was happening here. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth. There were other things that were going on we don't have time to get into. Um, it says, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. I'm sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the records of the generations of Noah. For Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. And it says that Noah walked with God. And so what we know about Noah, like what an amazing phrase to be said about a person, that this person walked with God. And so we know because, uh, uh, or that God used Noah in this time to repopulate and his children and their families to repopulate the earth after the fall. And then we're introduced to a man named Abram. And we're in Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to this man who's roughly about 75 years old. His name was originally Abram, but God changed his name to Abraham. Did you know that nobody is talked about more in the New Testament other than Moses than Abraham? He's a significant, plays a significant role in the Bible. If you go to Genesis chapter 12, this is God's plan for Abram. It says, now the Lord said to Abram in verse one, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you. Could you imagine this? Abram, I want you to leave. Leave your family, leave your friend, leave everything. Yeah, where are we going, God? Let me punch it into my maps. Where, where, oh, I'm not gonna tell you where you're going. Just do what I say. Go, and I'll let you know when you get there. Could you imagine that? But Abram did that, and I will make you, this is his promise, a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you, and in, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God promised Abram three things. Land, that he would be a great nation, and that God would bless him. Matter of fact, Abraham is listed in Hebrews 11 in that hall of faith that we see in the New Testament. God promised Abraham that he would be a great nation. But here's the problem. Abraham and his wife were unwilling, or not unwilling, unable to bear children. They're unable to have kids. And so he's seeing this promise, how will my descendants number? Because God told him his descendants would number as the stars of the sky. Well, how in the world is this gonna happen when him and his wife cannot have children? His wife is barren. And so Abraham did the one thing that we often do is that we think God needs our help. And we're not patient. And we want our timing instead of God's timing. And so Abraham's like, you know what? Actually, it's his wife's idea. And of course, the guy's going to say yes. Of course, the guy, hey, my maidservant, she's beautiful. Why don't you sleep with her and have a baby? Oh, I never even thought of that. That's a great idea, honey. So he does. And they have a child named Ishmael. And this would come back to haunt Abraham in so many ways. Because God still fulfilled his promise. When he was about 100 years old and his wife was about 90, she became pregnant. And then she had a son named Isaac. Named Isaac. And this would cause all sorts of problems. You wonder why even today as I speak, there is constant fighting in Israel over land. It's in the news all the time. This little country that's 100 miles long, and, or excuse me, 300 miles long and 100 miles wide, this little slither of land along the Mediterranean. Why does the world revolve, seem to revolve around this little plot of land? Temple Mount, Palestine, the Gaza Strip, all of it. Why? Because of this right here. You don't believe the Bible? What's going on right now originates right here because out of Ishmael came the Muslims. Out of Isaac came the Israelites. Ishmael was the firstborn. 
in those days, the firstborn male received the inheritance, received everything that the father, the majority of everything the father had. The firstborn was the favored one, the blessed one. But in this case, Ishmael was a son of the flesh. That wasn't God's promised child. Abraham took matters into his own hands. Isaac was the promised child. So that caused a significant problem, and we still have that problem today. We read about Ishmael in Genesis chapter 16. It says, you are now pregnant, and you'll give birth to a son, and you'll name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cries of distress. The son of yours, listen to how it describes Ishmael, will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone. And everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all of his relatives. Why are the Jews so hated? Why is there constant rift between the Muslims and the Israelites, the Jews? Because of this right here. It says that he will raise his fist to everyone, especially his own relatives. In Genesis chapter 17, speaking of Isaac, in verse 19, the Bible says, God replied, no, Sarah, no, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son. You will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. In other words, my promise is with Isaac, not with Ishmael. As for Ishmael, I will bless him just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes. He's still going to be a great man. And I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. And so what is that covenant? That's back in verse seven, which we don't have time to get into. So Isaac, the next major player in the book of Genesis. Isaac is this child of promise, born to Abraham and Sarah when they were in their old age. Around the age of 60, Isaac became the father of twins. And these twins, just like him and his brother, would have strife as well. Isaac became the father of two boys named Jacob and Esau. Isaac favored Esau because he was a kind of a rugged outdoors hunter, mountain man. And his brother Jacob was more of an indoor person, more of a mama's boy. And his mom favored him. His brother would actually steal his birthright, which would cause rift between them, and they would have to separate. And then we have Jacob. Jacob is this son of Isaac. Even though they were twins, Jacob and Esau, Esau came out first. And so technically Esau is the firstborn. Jacob is known as a deceiver because he deceived his father while his brother was off into giving him the blessing of the firstborn. I know this stuff's kind of hard for us to understand because of the cultural differences, but this stuff was really important back then. And so Jacob deceived his father and received this blessing from his father as the firstborn. And when Esau found out he was livid, he wanted to kill his brother, they had to separate. Out of Esau come the Edomites, and out of Jacob came the Israelites. Jacob falls in love with a woman named Rachel. After his mom dies, he finds a wife and, and uh, he has to work for her for seven years. But just as, just as Jacob deceived, Jacob would be deceived as well because he worked seven years for this woman that he loved. And in the middle of the night, in the dark, at the consummation point, his father-in-law slipped in the older sister who's supposed to be married first before the younger daughters, again, another cultural thing, slipped in Leah. And so now he has a problem on his hands. Now he's committed to marrying Leah and then he wants to marry Rachel still. And so he has to work another seven years for her. Jacob is the one who had this dream of this ladder going to heaven and God at the top and, and the angels ascending and descending, known as Jacob's ladder. In Genesis 32, J Jacob wrestles with God, waiting for God to bless him and protect him as he tries to reunite with his brother Esau. God would change Jacob's name to Israel. And despite Jacob's faults, God chose him to be the leader 
of a great nation. You know what's interesting about some of these people that, that, that we've talked about? All of them had significant flaws, committed major sins, and yet they're still known as great men of God. Isn't that such a blessing? That we can mess up, that we can commit great sins and still be known as a great man or woman of God. And then on the last kind of major player in the book of Genesis is Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob and Rachel. Jacob had children with Leah, but his first child with Rachel was Joseph. And just as his father favored his brother, he makes the same mistake and he favors Joseph over his brothers. You know the story. I'm not going to take a lot of time to go in, in, into it. His brothers don't like him. They sell him to these Egyptian merchants and they tell his parents that Joseph is dead. They're jealous of him. So their parents think that their son is dead. Joseph ends up in Egypt and through a series of events, God makes him, because of his faithfulness, because he's committed to the Lord, he ends up being the prime minister of the most powerful country in the world. Joseph is able to interpret dreams, and he does a Pharaoh, that there's a coming famine. So he prepares Egypt, and the famine comes. And so everybody from all over is coming to Egypt to get food. And lo and behold, Joseph's brothers, who sold him into slavery years and years earlier, are come begging for food. They don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. Joseph could have killed them all. He could have imprisoned them for what they did to him. But you know the story. Joseph chose to forgive and he said, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. And Joseph brings his brothers, his parents, his whole family to Egypt and gives them the best of the land and protects them and provides for them. And that leads us into the book next week of the book of Exodus because this is how all of the Israelites ended up in Egypt where at the time of Exodus, numbers in the millions, it all begins right here with Joseph. So we'll look at that next week. Let's wrap this up with the life applicational component. How is Genesis important to me? Why is Genesis important to me? Number one, Genesis lets us know and it reminds us that God created us. Listen, you are uniquely you. You are a one of one. There's nobody else like you. Your fingerprints, and now we know with technology, your DNA is different than everybody else's. God created you for a reason. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're not here by accident. Genesis reminds us that God created us. I am me because God created me to be me. You're valuable. You're loved. You're important. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. It's significant. That's such a blessing. Genesis reminds us that God created us. And that God, even in our flaws and our mistakes, God still wants to use us in incredible ways. The second thing that Genesis reminds us, Genesis reminds us that God recreated us. Not only did God create us, but God recreated us. We need recreation because we've all sinned. Just as Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible tells us that sin came over all of mankind when Adam sinned. And so all of us make mistakes. Romans tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody bats a thousand. Everybody makes mistakes. We all strike out. That's why we need a savior. Genesis is about God recreating us. He forgave Adam and Eve and he forgave Abraham and he forgave Jacob and he forgave Isaac. Joseph seems to be almost like the only almost perfect one. But even him, as great as he was, still was a sinner. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if any person be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We read this story in the book of Genesis about God's forgiveness. When God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around it, Abraham went to God and he said, God, if you, if I can find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? And God said, yes, I'll spare all the cities if you can find 50. 
And Abraham thought, thought about it. And he's like, well, what about 45? <laughs> and God's like, yes. And he's like, well, what about 40? If I can find 40 righteous, will you spare the city? Yes. What about 30? If I can find 30 righteous, will you spare those cities? God said, yes. What about 20? If I can find 20, God says, yes. Okay, God, what about 10? If I can only find 10 righteous, will you spare those cities? And God said, yes. You know what's amazing about that? Is you living for God matters. You say, oh, our world's going to hell in a handbasket. Our culture's so bad. Everything's so, yeah, things aren't great. But you matter, your life matters. God would spare all of these cities for 10 righteous people. The role you play in your family, the role you play in this community, the role you play in our world is important. God sees it and he knows it and it's important. Genesis reminds us that God create, recreates us through salvation in Jesus Christ. Number three, God is using us in his recreation of others. We have a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. God has chosen to use us to be his hands and his feet. And just as God created us and God recreated us, God uses us to help bring recreation in others, to invite people to church, to buy somebody a Bible, to share what God's done in our lives. God uses us to bring recreation in other people by which we all have that responsibility, not just the pastors. All of us have that responsibility. Whew. Genesis. Next week, Exodus. Read the Bible. Father, thank you so much for your blessings, for your word that is so transformative and so amazing in our lives. What an honor it is to be able to teach your word. God, I pray that you bless each person here. Father, maybe somebody walked in feeling insignificant. Maybe somebody walked in feeling like they don't matter. Maybe somebody walked in feeling like they're not noticed. God, I pray that they leave this morning knowing that they are an absolute masterpiece created by you. You created them unique. You created them for a reason. You love who they are. You love everything about them. Your word tells us that even the, the hairs on our heads are numbered. We're uniquely us because you created us like that. You love us. You care about us. And you have an incredible plan for us. Thank you so much for your word. Help us to be reminded of how much you love us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you wanna thank you. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to New Hope this week. You know, the church doesn't stop when the video does. And make sure that you share this with a friend you can even support what we're doing via the Give button here on the left. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single Sunday. And we cannot wait to see you this week, either in person or online. Have a great day.